Hello everyone, I'm Chris Tech and I'm the pianist for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson coming to you once more from my living room. It's been a joy and a pleasure to have you guys here every week. Stick around after the postlude and I'll tell you about the music I played today.
Good morning, happy Father's Day, and welcome to this Baha for worship service. Whenever you are joining us, wherever you are joining us from, we welcome you right here, right now, just as you are. We are the Baha Four, representing Unitarian Universalists across southeastern Arizona who join together to proclaim that we are stronger together. We represent Borderlands Unitarian Universalist in a motto, Sky Island Unitarian Universalist Church in Sierra Vista, Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Northwest Tucson, and the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson on the east side where I serve. We worship together during these times of pandemics and uprisings and the mountains, our mountains, on fire because we know we are stronger together. We acknowledge that we are rooted in the Sonoran Desert and that this land was stolen from the Tohono O'odham. We honor the native roots of this land and mourn the history of colonization here. As a Baja Four, we take inspiration from the landscape around us. We find in our desert stories of resilience and change, beauty and interconnection, life and death. This morning, we will turn our attentions first towards the celebration of Juneteenth. Juneteenth, which commemorates the end of chattel slavery in the United States states. It marks the final emancipation of people from their enslavers in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865, two and a half years after President Abraham Lincoln signed the Declaration of Independence. We acknowledge that the systematic enslavement of people of African descent did not end with emancipation. The, it has persisted through Jim Crow laws, redlining, systems of policing, mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, and more. And today, we turn our attention towards the celebration of June, Juneteenth. If you have a chalice or candle, will you light it with me as I light mine? And will you celebrate with me that on June 19, 1865, the African American community of Galveston, Texas, discovered from a Union general that they were free. Just imagine how they must have thought of their past and wondered at their future on that day. Imagine the ancestors who survived the Middle Passage chained together in those toxic ship holds. And imagine the generations who survived whips and separation of families and brutal work, the loss of human status that was slavery. Imagine the love and wisdom and strength they imparted to keep their people grow going all those long years until that jubilation day, that Juneteenth, when the community knew itself as free. Imagine what it must be to look at your hands and arms as if they are new. Imagine how the world must spin as you twirl in glee all the colors sharper, the bird song sweeter, the summer air lighter. Oh, the dizzying joy to be free. And imagine their children and children's children and how they gathered and spoke and sang and ate each June 19th with celebrations happening farther and farther away from Texas each year. Imagine how those communities might sing and recite and take nourishment differently as they had need, as circumstances and battles changed, just as they must at this truest Thanksgiving, this real Independence Day. And now in 2020, 
many are celebrating. Diverse groups will march all over the world to remind us that black lives matter and blue, black lives of Unitarian Universalism will spend a day empowering body and mind, spirit and heart for the work of justice and liberation ahead and to make an affirmation of black joy and excellence. Just imagine if we affirmed black joy and excellence every year and every day. May it be so. That's Reverend Bethany, that's right. Do you know she's a minister, right? That's her job? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know that there was a time not too long ago when women couldn't be ministers? No, actually. Yeah. So this person, this is Olympia Brown. She this was is born. Not this one. Right? Mm -mm. This one? Yeah, that's Olympia Brown. Who's she this? was born in 1835. But who's this? That's Olympia. But who's this? That's her grown up. But who's this? That's her mom. And this is the dad. No, that's Olympia. <laughs> that's Olympia, and that's her as a baby, mm -hmm. and that's her mom. Oh. Yes. Girls of her race and class weren't supposed to whistle. I said, the, I said Can you whistle? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you run fast? Let me go see if I can. So when Olympia was a little girl, she wasn't allowed to do those things. And she wasn't supposed to do well in school. But she did. She did all those things and all those things and more. All those things and more? I don't think that's possible. It was, and it's possible for you, too. Uh, in her town, some person said, little ladies ought to be quiet. Little girls ought not make themselves No! Hard. This is a funny story. Okay. <laughs> but Olympia did. She had a voice and she was going to use it every day. When Olympia Brown was a teenager, young women weren't supposed to go to college. 
Young women weren't supposed to leave home and go off and learn complicated things. But Olympia did. She did all those things and more. Olympia left home and went to Antioch College. She went to class and she studied and she learned all kinds of complicated things. Here, you can have Olympia Brown traveled all over in a horse and buggy, giving speeches to convince people that women deserve the right to vote. She wrote hundreds of letters. She spoke to the representatives and senators in Congress. She marched in parades. Olympia yeah. and her friends worked hard to get women the right to vote. Olympia Brown had a voice and she yeah. used it every day, every yeah. day for over 50 years. And finally, when Olympia Brown was old, the laws changed and women were allowed to vote. In November of 1920, Olympia was 85 and she voted for the first time. Or Jen. Olympia always had a voice and she'd used it to make sure that she and all the other women in the United States had a vo vote as well. On this Father's Day, I invite you now into a period of quiet meditation. Close your eyes if you wish. Get comfortable where you are. Think about a father figure who you carry in your heart. I invite you to remember both the gifts and the wounds you receive from that person or persons. If any feelings come up, just breathe deeply and honor those feelings as a connection to your heart. I invite you now to listen to some fathering words that some of us don't hear as often as we need to. I love you just the way you are. I have confidence in you. You can achieve your goals. I will stand behind you. You can depend on me. I'm proud of you. Stand up for yourself. Your opinions and your feelings are important. I have faith in you. When you are ready, you can breathe deeply and open your eyes. Say This Isn't the End, a poem for Sunday by Richard Blanco. Say we live on. Say we'll forget the masks that kept us from dying from the invisible, but say we won't ever forget the invisible masks we realized we had been wearing most of our lives, disguising ourselves from each other. 
say we won't veil ourselves again, that our souls will keep breathing timelessly, that we won't return to clocking our lives with lists and appointments, say we'll keep our days as errant as sun showers, impulsive as a star's falling, say this isn't our end. Say I'll get to be as thrilled as a boy spinning again in my barber's chair. Tell him how I'd missed his winged scissors chirping away my shaggy hair, eclipsing my eyes as warm clouds of foam, the sharp love of his razor's tender strokes on my beard. Say I'll get more chances to say more than thanks. Shirley at the checkout line, praise her turquoise jewelry, her son in photos taped to her register, dare to ask about her throat cancer, say this isn't her end. Say my mother's cloudy eyes won't die from the goodbye kiss I last gave her, say that wasn't our final goodbye, nor will we be stranded behind a quarantine window trying to see our refracted faces beyond the glare. Read our lips, press the warmth of our palms to the cold glass. Say I won't be kept from her bedside to listen to her last words that will have years to speak of the decades of our unspoken love that separated us. Say, this isn't how we'll end. Say, all the restaurant chairs will get back on their feet. That we'll all sit for another lifetime of savoring all we had never fully savored. The server as poet reciting flavors not on the menu. The candlelight flicker as appetizer. Friends, spicy gossip and rich, saucy laughter sharing entrees of memories. No longer six feet apart, our beloved's lips as velvety as the wine, the dessert served sweet in their eyes. Say this is no one's end. Say my husband and I will keep on honing our home cooking together, find new recipes for love in the kitchen, our kisses and tears while dicing onions, eggs cracking in tune to Aretha's croon, dancing as we heat up the oven. Say, we'll never stop feasting on the taste of our stories, sweet or sour, but say our table will never be set for just one. Say, neither of us dies. Many more cheers to our good health. Say, we will never end. Say we'll all still take the time we once needed to walk alone and gently through our neighborhoods. Keep noticing the zen of anthills and sidewalk cracks blossoming weeds, of yappy dogs and silent swing sets rusting in backyards, of neat hedges, hiding mansions and scruffy lawns of boarded up homes. Say we won't forget our seeing that every kind of life is a life worth living, worth saving. Say, this is nobody's end. Or say, this will be my end. Say, the loving hands of a gloved, gowned angels risking their lives to save mine won't be able to keep me here. Say, this is the last breath of my last poem, will of my last thoughts. I've witnessed massive swarms of fireflies grace my garden like never before. Drawn to the air, cleansed of our arrogant greed, their glow a flashback to the time before us, omen of earth without us, a reminder we are never immune to nature. I say this might be the end we've always needed to begin again. I say this may be the end to let us hope to heal, to evolve, reach the stars. Again, I'll say 
heal, evolve, reach and become the stars that became us. Whether or not this is or is not our end. Say this isn't the end. I hear in Richard Blanco's words, both an aspiration and a charge. Say this isn't the end of our lives, of our work, of our faith. Say this isn't the end for all of us, for everything. This isn't the end. This is not an end, but a reflection point. A time when we can look back for wisdom and reach forward with hope. These past few weeks, we have been reimagining church. And the question this week we are exploring is, who? If we faithfully engage with this challenge of reimagining church, then who will we become? I wonder if Olympia Brown knew who we would become. I wonder if she could have imagined us. Did she know that 100 years after her life, within 100 years of her life, there would be a majority of women ministers in her faith tradition? Did she imagine that as an abolitionist and a suffragist, that within 100 years of her life, People of color would still not be able to exercise their right to vote due to voter suppression and mass incarceration. Maybe she wouldn't be so surprised. So how then are we to imagine with any degree of specificity what will come of us 100 years from now? I could say a lot of words now about the dreams I hear among Unitarian Universalists and from beyond us. And I worry that the work we actually need to do might get lost in those words. Sometimes we Unitarian Universalists, and I'm a lifelong one, so I include myself here, sometimes we use words when what we need to do is reflect. Sometimes we use words when what we need to do is get to work. One of you out there watching said to me this week, when we Unitarian Universalists get lost in our words, I get out to the land like my grandfather taught me. And so, so that I don't get too lost in my words, I'm choosing to use this time to tell you about two ancestors of mine, one by blood and one by faith, who have given me wisdom to navigate the question of who we are becoming. In my extended family, we place a high value on education and innovation. The two became tied together in one particular relative many generations ago who was an inventor. Many of his inventions were flops, totally unsuccessful. But the one that was successful was very, very successful. He created a little part that allowed oil to be extracted from the ground more easily. And rather than pay him in cash, the company who he sold this to paid him in stock. This stock has grown considerably since then and has paid for at least five generations of college in my direct lineage. I come from generational wealth, and in my family, we use our wealth to educate. This family history has led my spouse to reflect early on in our relationship. Yours might be the only family I've ever met that talks exclusively about religion and politics at the dinner table. And as I turn to this family tradition now, I realize how much I have gained from that education and how much of my country's history and the world's history was left out of that education. 
I'm realizing now how little I was taught about the history of colonization in the United States or the history of black, indigenous, and people of color communities. And lucky for me, I don't need that oil stock to educate myself now. Whenever I read a book like How to Be Racist by Ibram X. Kendi or The Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, I am doing what my ancestors have taught me. I am laying groundwork for the dreams that the children will fulfill. And when that self-education gets tough, I remember that my ancestors were not just really smart people who valued education. They were also inventors. Inventors who invested throughout their lives in learning, creating, and innovating. Invention is integral to the process of education. The second ancestor I'm calling on is Reverend Olympia Brown. We heard about her earlier. Here's another story. By the time she was in her 80s, Reverend Brown was growing tired of the static nature of the suffrage movement, which she was, had been part of all of her adult life. And then sometime in 1913, Alice Paul and Lucy Barnes started the Women's Party. And Reverend Brown, who was then 78, found her hope again. A biographer of Reverend Brown's wrote it this way, that she, quote, welcomed the most confrontational and streetwise tactics of the Women's Party and was elated with their strategy of mounting large vigils and demonstrations to mobilize support. When she was asked to be a charter member of this more militant and energetic group, she stated, I belonged to this party before I was born. Brown joined in many of the demonstrations organized by the Women's Party. In freezing rain, in bitter cold, in spite of dangerous confrontations and little police protection from hecklers, the octogenarian minister from Wisconsin was there. During one memorable demonstration, protesting Woodrow Wilson's turning his back on the suffrage amendment, she publicly burned his speeches in front of the White House. The story of Reverend Brown's later years reminds me that sometimes we need to use unconventional tactics to build that future we dream of. So who are your ancestors? What have they taught you? And what did they leave out? And who will call you ancestor? What will you teach them? What will you leave out? Friends, as we build towards a future where who we are is radically different and more revolutionary in scope than any of us could ever dream, may we commit to our own learning and the reinvention of what we have been taught. May we engage in this long haul work of justice, supporting diverse tactics which speak truth to power. May we, in the words of Richard Blanco, heal, evolve, reach, and become the stars that became us. And may we remember always that we will get there. Heaven knows how we'll get there and that where we go, we go together. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we'll get there, heaven knows how we will get
enough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 These words of closing come from Reverend Dr. Kiyama Raman. Now is the time to call on the memories of the ancestors who thought they could not walk another step towards freedom, and yet they did. It is the time and place to call on the memories of the ancestors who, when the darkness of their lives threatened to take away the hope and light, reached a little deeper prayed another prayer. It is the time and place to remember that those who came through the long night to witness another sunrise. It is that time and place to remember the oceans of tears shed to deliver us to this time, to remember the bent knees and bowed backs, to remember the fervent voices asking, begging, beseeching for loved ones sold off. Time to remember their laughter and joy, though they had far less and little reason for optimism, yet they stayed on the path towards a better day. Time to hold the steadfast hand and hearts and prayers of the ancestor that have brought us this far. Time to make them proud and show them and ourselves what we are made of. Time to show them that their prayers and sacrifices and lives were not in vain and did not go unnoticed, nor have they been forgotten. Did you know that this day would come? Did you not know that we would have to change places? Did you not know that just as our ancestors were delivered, that you would also be delivered? It is that time and that place to know that it is our turn, that we must leave a legacy for our children and all the children. It is that time and that place. We are the ones we have been waiting for. For that, let us be eternally grateful. Amen, and blessed be. Get up and dance with me.
course, well, yeah, yeah, a great tune like that. You can't let it happen just once in a service like that. The prelude today and the interlude were from William Grant Still. He's an American composer. He is often called the Dean of African American Composers. He was active from the 30s to the 60s, more or less. And um, that was his piece called Elegy from about 1963, originally for organ. My thanks to Sky Hart, the Dean of the American Guild of Organists chapter in Phoenix, for turning me onto that piece and graciously sending me a copy so I could share it with you. Thank you so much. of the boys' um, births.